Okay, we have the recording going, and so I think we're ready to start. Thanks again for joining us today for this uh, second part of Teaching at a Distance. Uh, many of you attended last week, and some of you may be new and uh, signed up for just the second session. We are grateful that you're joining us today. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. There were a number, number of people asking about certificates in the chat. We will be getting certificates out to people after each of the sessions. Uh, it may take us a few days to get them out. Uh, session one has not gone out yet, I don't believe, but should be going out soon. So um, it will be a little bit of a delay after each one of the sessions before the certificates go out, but we will be sending those to you. Elmer, I should be sending out um, session one by tomorrow afternoon at the latest. So you all can look for that in your email if you attended the first session. Okay, great. Thank you, Janie. So the presenters for today's session are myself. I'm Elmer Seward. I'm Vice President of Education Services at WHRO. And we have Janie Everett, who's the technology manager for WHRO. Uh, Mitzi Fell Seward, who's the vice president for digital learning at WHRO. And Lindsay Horner, who's manager of eMedia VA at WHRO. So each one of us will be taking some time. Uh, Janie and I will be taking uh, the lion's share of the time during this presentation today. But Mitzi and Lindsay also have um, information to share with you about resources that are available to you. And we'll be getting to those towards the end of the presentation. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. If you were with us last week, you know I showed a video. It's uh, one of my favorite commercials. It was done by a company called EDS. And it aired first on the Super Bowl and it was a video of cowboys herding cats out on the range. And I like to tell teachers who are new to teaching at a distance that it is much like herding cats. You've got students everywhere and students in all different situations and you're trying to pull them together and get them to go uh, the same direction. When I was supervising teachers with Virtual Virginia, I would tell them that um, what they were going to do in virtual Virginia teaching online was very much like herding cats, trying to keep up with each student and keep them where they needed to be and keep them headed in the right direction and keep them motivated. It really is very much like te teaching one on one and not so much like teaching in front of groups of students. And one of the things I want to make sure that I share with you is uh, to follow the cowboy motif. There's no magic bullet, partner. Um, we'll share with you some concepts and ideas today. And I won't guarantee you that they will work for every student and in every situation. What I can tell you is that they will help you be more successful, that they will help you uh, keep more students engaged and help you keep more students on track. Uh, keep in mind also, one of the things that, that we need to know going into this is each of you are working in different school divisions and each school division has its own set of guidelines for you in how you're gonna be working with students at a distance and it's different sets of requirements each school division uses its own set of tools. Just one example, if you're using a learning management system, some school divisions are using Schoology, some are using Canvas, some are using Desire to Learn, some may be using Moodle. Some school divisions are using Google Classroom, which is uh, not a full-blown LMS, but it's LMS-like, it has some LMS tools in it. So as we give you advice, you have to take what we give you and kind of apply it to your particular situation. How can you use that with the tools that you have uh, within the guidelines that your school division has given you? Now, speaking of the fact that we are 
that we have individuals here from school divisions all over the region. I'm gonna try something today that I tried last week and it didn't work, but I'm not bright enough not to try it again. Uh, I've set up a poll. We need to gather information on how many attendees we have from each of the school divisions. Um, if you weren't here last time and you're not aware, WHRO is owned by the 21 school divisions in the Hampton Roads region. And every year we give them a report, each school division we give a report of services we've provided to that school division and to their teachers. And so one of the things we try to do is for every training that we conduct, we try to gather information on what school divisions teachers are from. So I have a poll that I've set up and I think, I think last time it was user error. I think this time I have it set up correctly. So it will be a three question poll. Um, and the reason it's three questions is that for polling in Zoom, you can only have 10 possible responses. With 21 school divisions, I couldn't get all of them in one question. So the poll will ask question one, uh, which of these school divisions do you work in? And there'll be seven school divisions. And then the eighth item below that is none of the school divisions above. So you'll look at those seven. If those are not the school division you work in, you click none of the divisions above. Then you go on to question two and look for your school division there. If it's there, click it. If not, click none of the school divisions above. And then go on to three. You must answer all three questions. So on every question, you'll either answer a school division's name or none of the school divisions above. So let me go ahead and launch the poll and gather that information. So we're getting close to having everyone answered. Just remember you find your school division, you click your school division, and on the other two questions, you will click none of the school divisions above. We have just a few more people to answer. I'll give you just a minute longer for those of you who haven't uh, completed the survey yet. Remember, find your school division in question one or question two or question three, click it. And then on the other two questions, click none of the school divisions above. I think we'll take 30 seconds more and then we're gonna wrap up the survey. And this is an anonymous survey. We still have just a few people who haven't answered. Elmer, there's been a few people with a couple of issues just scrolling through the questions, not necessarily being able to scroll or um, they clicked in poll. So I've just asked that they just add it to the window on the chat panel, just in case. Sounds good. Thank you, Mitzi. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we will. Okay, I saw a couple more registered. 
I think we'll go ahead and end the poll now. And just out of curiosity, let's see what, what our results look like. We have uh, teachers from Accomack, Chesapeake, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Suffolk, West Point, Weemsburg, James City County, and York County. I don't know if I missed anybody when I mentioned those, but so we've got teachers from a number of the school divisions in the region. So thank you for uh, answering that survey. So as I said before, there's no magic bullet, but what we're gonna share with you today are overall concepts that you can apply, tools that you might be able to use, and resources that you uh, certainly can find valuable in trying to work with students at a distance. And so if we're trying to keep students moving in the same direction, in, in the right direction, what we need is student engagement. They have to be engaged with the content, engaged with the course. And the question is, how do you, keep the, how do you get them engaged? How do you keep them engaged? And how do you keep them moving in the right direction? Many of you may have heard this quote before, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I was asked the question this past week, how do I build a relationship with students I don't even know and students I've never even met? And we're gonna to try to give you a few tips on how to do that today because it's important for students to be engaged with the teacher and to feel that the teacher's engaged with them. It's important for them to know that the teacher actually cares about them as a human being and not just somebody at the end uh, uh, sitting in front of a computer. So this is important. I think this is very important to know in dealing with students at a distance. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Student engagement is driven by teacher presence and teacher engagement. Teacher engagement with the content and teacher engagement with the students. So here are a few tips for building and maintaining engagement. Set the rules. I'm going to give you some ideas for interacting with students and students interacting with one another. But one of the important things with working with students online is that you set the rules of netiquette. What is acceptable in communications? What's not acceptable in communications? What's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And you need to do that early with students. Let them know exactly how they should be interacting with one another, how they should be interacting with the course, what, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. You must set the rules. And I think you can probably find online any number of places, ideas about netiquette and what you can communicate to students about what is acceptable, and what's not acceptable. Obviously, one of the things that they need to do is treat each other with respect and treat each other with kindness. Even if they disagree with someone, they disagree in a respectful way and express their disagreement in a respectful way, that they don't bully or shame. Um, and these types of behaviors, I think you're well aware, are easy to do when you're online. We see, we see it happening all the time in social media. And we want students to know this is not social media. This is a place where we treat each other as we want to be treated. Setting the rules then, I would suggest that you begin your year with a get to know you activity. If you have a learning management system, you might want to use your discussion forum for this, where you ask the students to tell you and the other students in the class some things about themselves so that you get to know them and so that they get to know each other. Um, I would suggest in our, the TikTok age that we live in, that if you have a, a tool, and many learning management systems have this tool that allows students to create videos of themselves 
brief videos and upload them as an introduction of themselves, that you allow them to do that. Um, that way students get to see each other, they get to hear each other, you get to see them, you get to hear them. And you might even, I would suggest, you would do your own first so they get a sample of what it would look like. You've communicate with them the rules. I would suggest that you give them specific information that you would like for them to share, rather than saying, share something about yourself, because you could get a wide range of things, some things that you're not necessarily um, interested in having shared through the group, uh, if you leave it that wide open. But you may give them uh, some questions like, do you like sports? If so, what's your favorite sport? What's your favorite subject in school? Um, things that would tell us a little bit about themselves and tell you something about them as well. And that's gonna be important in just a moment. I'll also suggest to you, if you're using a learning management system, most of them will allow you to preview a post before it's actually visible to the other students. And I would suggest that early on in the course that you use that feature, students submit, it's, it doesn't become visible to the other students until you've looked at it and approved it, and then it's visible to the other students. That will prevent uh, inappropriate content from going through. Now, once you become comfortable with your students and if you feel comfortable um, not having to preview responses as you move through uh, the weeks and months, you may decide not to use that feature anymore. But I would use that early on to make sure that everything that's being posted is appropriate and following the rules that you've established. And before I go on to the master sheet, another idea that you might have is to have the other students read or listen to or watch this, all of the students' postings. Then you may give them an assignment to find two or three students who share the same um, hobbies or share the same likes, who, um, who are similar to them in some way and have them respond in the, uh, in the discussion forum on who they identified, who, who was like them in some way and how they were like them, so that you get them involved in looking at each other's um, postings and that they start to become familiar with the other students in the class. Now onto the third bullet, master sheet of student info. I will tell you that the most successful teachers that I worked with in uh, virtual Virginia had this, had this neat system. They had a master sheet of their students and from this get to know you activity, they would jot down, they would keep track of those things that they wanted to remember about each of their students something important, something that their student really liked, that they were involved in, like a student says that they love to dance, they take dance classes, things like that. And then every time, or just about every time, they would have a conversation with that student, occasionally when they would have an email exchange with that student, they'd say, hey, um, how is such and such going? Are you still, you, interest, you uh, indicated you're interested in running. Are you doing much running uh, during this time that we're out of school? And what happens is they start building this relationship with students because the student says, oh, my teacher cares about me. My teacher knows that about me. I must be important. And as they build that relationship with students, the students tend to be more engaged in the course. Again. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Best teachers that I ever saw in virtual Virginia did that and they did that on a regular basis. Have regular contact with students. If you don't hear from somebody for a week or two weeks, then you think that they must not care much about you and they don't care about your activity and whatever the two of you share. 
Same thing is true for students. If they don't hear from you for a long period of time, they feel like you're just not interested in their participation, so why should they be interested in their participation? Response time is really important. If a student asks a question, they call you and leave a message, or they email you with a question, or just need some information, the quicker you can get back to them, the more likely it is they are to stay engaged in the course. Again, it's one of these things that the longer you go not hearing from someone, the greater the, the perception is that they really don't care about your question, they really don't care about you as a student, and if they don't care about you as a student or how you're doing or what your question is, why should you care about being involved in the course? Tone is very important. Remember, humor doesn't come across well in uh, written communication, um, in emails, and so you need to be careful and make sure that your tone is always positive and uh, accepting because nothing can turn a student off more quickly than to think that they've been snubbed by their teacher or that uh, the teacher said something that really was not very uh, flattering about them. And then share events and accomplishments. So as you're having conversations with students and as you're having phone calls with them or email exchanges with them and you ask them, hey, how is so-and-so going? You know, how was, um, you were a competitive swimmer. Now, we, we all know that um, regular activities are gonna be disrupted during this time. But if they've got something going on and for example, they were able to compete somewhere and they won an award, say to them, do you mind if I share that with the class? And if they're okay with you sharing it, if you're doing news items, you send out a news item, if you're sending out a, um, an email blast to the class, say, by the way, your classmate so-and-so did such and such, again, I would get the student's permission first to share it. But if they're okay with it, I would share it with the class again it builds this relationship with the students where my teacher thinks I'm important and I get to shine in front of the rest of the class. A great idea to keep students engaged and keep them interested in being part of the course. Let's see, Mitzi, did I lose my screen share? Because I don't see it. You did just now, yes. Okay, let me go back. Okay, I think we're back now. Yes, we'll see it again. And then another important thing about keeping students engaged is having interesting, meaningful activities for them to be involved in. Nothing will turn a, stu a student off faster then wrote boring assignments. Now, we all know that occasionally you're gonna have those. Um, and students are very quick to pick up on times when they're just getting assignments to get assignments. Give students something that allows them to actually use what they're learning to apply it in class. If you can involve them in interesting and meaningful activities, and I said it last time, volume of work is not the important thing. It's the quality of the work that you give them that's really important. If they see the work as meaningful, as valuable, they will tend to be more engaged in the class. And then increasing engagement through communication, time to response again for messaging and assignments especially assignments. Uh, research shows us that timely response to assignments increases students' learning. They learn from, what you, from the um, input that you give them, and that learning is greater when that response comes quickly. And then respond to the learning. Make sure that when you give them a response on their assignments, 
that you talk specifically about what it was they were to learn, how they did in relation to what they were to learn, what they could have done to, to have made that uh, response or that assignment better. So they, they're learning from what you're telling them because you're responding to the learning. And then communication again has to be clear, 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 clear. I can't say it too many times. Um, if you remember the video that I showed last week of the guy asking uh, the lady to go make 10 copies of something, he didn't give her any more direction than go make the copies. Obviously, there was more information that needed to be given to her. In class, when we're standing in front of students, it's easy for us to say something and not give it clearly or completely. And I think the next one is detailed, yes. Clear and detailed information because you're in front of class and if somebody doesn't understand it, just say, oh, I don't understand this. Are we supposed to do this? And then you just answer. And we, we don't think much about it because it's a very easy and simple thing to do. When you're teaching at a distance, they may not be able to get that question answered right away. So it's very important to make sure that all your communications are clear. All of your directions are detailed so that students don't get lost and sit waiting to get a response from you on how they're supposed to do something. Now, just a few, uh, a few tips on direct instruction. Um, we're gonna be talking in another webinar in about one, two, three, three weeks about using uh, video conferencing software for instruction. So we're not gonna go into a lot of detail today, but I do wanna give you a few tips today. Know your tool. Some, as I said earlier, some of you are using Zoom, some are using Microsoft, um, I think it's Meeting. Some of you may be using um, Ultra, some of you may be using Big Blue Button, some might be using Google Hangouts. Um, so for me to tell you specifically what you can and can't do with the tool that you're using, just wouldn't be possible. I don't know all of those tools that well. I know some of them. Some of them I only know um, a little bit about. But most of the web conferencing uh, tools have tutorials. Take a look at the tutorials. Go over them, find out what it can do, what it can't do, how you can use it, uh, with your particular circumstance. So get to know the tool. They can do lots of things. Take some time to find out what they can do. Then if you're using um, web conferencing tools for direct instruction, incentivize attendance. Give students a grade for attending. They get a 100 for attending or some other incentive. Um, make sure that students know that if they attend, they will receive whatever it is. And then record for off time viewing. Not every student will be able to, to attend live. And so if that happens, you wanna make sure that you have a recording for those who were not able to attend live. And then give them some brief, nice brief. You don't wanna give yourself a lot of work and you don't wanna give them a lot of work, but some brief assignment that if they're watching the recording rather than attending live, they complete that assignment and the assignment shows you that they actually viewed the recording. It could be a simple question that they have to answer. Uh, they watch the, the recording and then they answer the question, they turn it into you and you can tell from the answer that they viewed that recording. And then I would also incentivize that as well. Just because a student isn't in a live session doesn't mean that they missed it because they didn't intend to be there. Things happen in life. And so sometimes we can't always be where we want to be. Now I'm gonna turn the time over to Janie to talk to you about uh, a couple of tools 
that you can use to support direct instruction. So Janie, Janie, I'm gonna turn the time over to you for right now. Okay, sounds good. So hello everyone, it is me, Janie Everett. I talked to you last week too, for those of you who were here with us last week. I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of what Elmer was talking about, and that is keeping your students engaged while providing them direct instruction digitally, <laughs> because we, of course, are not in school buildings right now. Um, we need to rely on these digital tools more than ever. So I know Elmer talked a little bit as well about LMS, learning management systems. And the great thing about the tools that I'm going to share with you is that, um, you know, for those of you who don't use an LMS or only use one partially, these tools kind of fill in those blanks for things that you might be missing if you don't have a learning management system. And on the other hand, if you do have a learning management system that you use quite frequently, these are all tools that very easily uh, work well with most learning management systems. I have experience using quite a few LMSs. Uh, most recently, I worked at Virginia Beach, which was a Schoology district, and every single one of these digital tools I'm going to show you, I was able to embed or add a link into my LMS because ideally we really just want our students um, getting their information from from just one place. We don't want them kind of running all over the internet. So that's one of the cool things about this, especially when they're learning from home and we're not right next to them to keep an eye on their screens and what they're doing. So this is kind of going to run the same as it did last week as far as my part goes. If you joined us last week, I gave you a brief synopsis of Class Dojo. And I'm just going to run through a couple of my slides and give you the gist of what these two different digital tools can do for you. And then if you're interested, at the end, I'm gonna give you some more information about sessions that I'll be doing in the upcoming weeks that go a little more in depth in these tools. So the first tool that I wanna to talk to you about is Screencastify. And Screencastify is a Google Chrome extension, very easy to download on your Chrome browser. And basically it just lets you record what's happening on your screen. It sounds very simple and that's because it is simple, which is a good thing, especially when we're learning how to use something new during a pandemic. Uh, it's also completely free as are all of the tools that I will show you and it's really, really easy to share your videos with students. Um, and you'll see they save automatically to your Google Drive <laughs> and things are very, very easy to share from Google Drive. All right, go ahead to the next slide, Elmer, please. All right, so like I mentioned before, it is a Google Chrome extension. This one is not an app or a website. However, you can go to screencastify.com to download it. Um, very self-explanatory. You click download and it, it downloads in like two seconds. And then when you do download it, you'll see where that arrow is pointing. You'll have this little um, like orangish pink arrow and that means it's downloaded. And then you click on that arrow to bring up your recording options. Go ahead to the next slide. So when you do click on that little arrow in your Chrome web browser, these are the options that pop up that you see. We will go over these in depth in upcoming weeks, but you can choose to record just your browser that you're in. You can choose your whole desktop or just your webcam, which would be your face from your camera. Um, you have to allow your computer to give Screencastify access to your microphone and your webcam if you want to. And when you have all of your options selected, you just go ahead and click record. It's as easy as that. Okay, go ahead to the next one. So once you are actually recording your screen, Screencastify gives you some really cool free tools down here at the bottom. Um, as you can see, there's a little pencil so you can annotate on your screen as you are talking or recording your movements on the screen. <coughs> and then of course there's an arrow as well. And you can't see them right here, but there's also a really cool spotlight tool um, and a clicker tool that I will 
show you if you join me next time as well. All right, go ahead to the next one. When you are finished recording, you just click stop. And like I mentioned before, your video will automatically save to your Google Drive. You'll see a Google folder that says Screencastify and all the videos that you create automatically go there. You can share the link to your video as you can see on the screen right now. If you use Google, you can put it right in your Google Classroom, get the embed code to put into another LMS, the QR code, however you wanna go about that. All right, go ahead to the next slide. And the second tool I would like to show you for direct instruction is Nearpod. This is an incredibly useful tool. There is a paid version, but there's also a very great free version as well. <coughs> Nearpod is a website. You go to nearpod.com and it's also an app. You can use the app as well. For students to use Nearpod, they just go to nearpod.com or they go to the app and they just enter a six digit code that you give them. So what Nearpod is in a nutshell is a tool that lets you show students slides, kind of like PowerPoint or Google Slides, except really it's so much more because it's interactive. Your students aren't just flipping through a bunch of slides. They get to click on things and answer questions and you get all of that feedback in real time. So it really lets you assess your students well. It's a, it's a great assessment tool. Go ahead to the next slide. So here's a brief description from their website on what Nearpod is. Students complete assignments independently while you gain insights into the student's understanding with post-session reports. You can easily integrate Nearpod with your LMS, your learning management system, such as Google Classroom, Canvas, Schoology, um, whatever LMS that you're using, this is really compatible with all of them. Next slide, please. So in Nearpod, you have options to create all sorts of different slides. Again, I am not going to get into all of them today, but you can count on getting into these next time if you join us. Um, you can put videos on your slides, websites. They have some really great 3D models of cells and all sorts of things. The PHET are these digital labs that students can manipulate. All of the Nearpod virtual reality um, sites are in there all sorts of fun things. Next slide. And then activities, you see it switched over from content over to activities is now highlighted in blue. These are all the slides you can add where students get to interact. So you can give them open-ended questions, quizzes, make them draw something, take a poll, lots of really great options to, to assess your students and see what they know after you've given them some direct instruction. Okay. Another really great thing about Nearpod is that they have a whole bunch of lessons that are already made. Some of them are free, some of them you have to pay for, but there are plenty of free ones in there for you to grab. Go ahead to the next slide. All right, and that was it for Screencastify and Nearpod. Thank you, Janie. So, now I just want to, I, I have a video I'd like to share with you about students talking about being out of school. This is the first time we all come together and we sit down and we just kind of remember what family is and it's been in a way beautiful difficult but beautiful once they announced that it is safe to go outside again i would like to go visit all my family members because it has been a long time since i've seen them i would visit my girlfriend i haven't seen her in a while and uh, i'd like to be able to see her again i know the first place i'll be going is to go see my best friend the first thing i'm gonna do is go hang out with all my friends and have a milkshake because we always grab milkshakes at johnny rockets so i'm so excited to go do that the moment we get out. My mental health has So what we hear students saying is about being out of school, 
one of the things they miss the most is their friends and being around them. I mean, it's no surprise to us. We know that school is a social uh, setting for students, that um, if you were to ask most of them what they miss most about school, they wouldn't mention the academics. They would mention it's the social aspect. Um, having um, uh, almost 17 year old who has been going crazy during the uh, COVID-19 um, social distancing because she just hasn't been able to have the kind of um, social interactions with people as she had in the past. I can tell you it's very important for students. Uh, so the question is, when students are working at a distance, even if it's not COVID-19, how do we go about building community and collaboration with students? It's very important. Being able to interact with other students is important to students. Again, you have to set the rules. Uh, you have to clearly define for them what's appropriate and what's not appropriate as they interact. There has to be teacher supervision. I noticed in the chat uh, that Mitzi noted about discussion forums, teachers need to supervise students in any setting where they're interacting with one another to make sure that students are following the rules and that interaction is appropriate. And then teachers need to step in and stop it if, if it's not going on. Um, when I was working with Virtual Virginia, um, we had a group of students who turned on another student in a discussion forum, and they were really bashing that student and uh, really bullying the student. It can happen, it can happen very quickly. So it's important for teachers to supervise any setting where they have, where they set up for student interaction, whether it's a discussion forum or, um, and I think I've got next thing, well, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, if you're gonna use breakout rooms in your web conferencing software, make sure that you're dropping into each of those breakout rooms and checking on what they're doing and how the conversation's going. And if the conversation is not going well, that you pull out the students uh, or you stop the uh, interaction and then you deal with it. Um, again, online, it is very easy for students to be unkind to one another. and it, and it's your role to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, the get to know you discussion at the beginning, I think is a great way for students to start to get to know one another. If you can structure it in a way where they have to interact with the content that they see, they have to look at what other students have said, they have to do something with that productive and something positive. Um, breakout rooms I mentioned, you can use those in your web conferencing software. Most of them have them. So you can put students in groups and allow them to have discussions in groups. And you can drop into each of those groups and listen in on the discussion and even add to the discussion if possible. Um, I would suggest in the beginning the breakout rooms that be used for very focused types of discussion and be used for brief periods of time. Get the students used to using the discussion, the breakout rooms, and then also uh, get them used to following the netiquette, that, the rules of netiquette that you set up for them. Discussion forums is, are a great place for students to be able to interact with one another. And again, if you can involve them in video interaction, even better, students love making videos. They, and it gives them a chance again, not just to see text on a page, but it gets to see the person as a real person. They can see their face, they can listen to them talk. And I'll also say it's great for them to see videos of you as well. Uh, again, last week I mentioned be real. They need to see you as a real person. So anything that you can share with them that's professionally acceptable, about you as a person helps build that relationship with the students that you have. Um, chats, some LMS learning management systems have chat features. Again, it needs to be supervised um, if you're gonna use that feature. 
And then Google Share, you may have students sharing and working collaboratively uh, with um, Google Docs and, and other um, pieces of the Google Suite. They could put a presentation together as a group. Allow students opportunities to work together and to work with one another because the more they feel part of a community and part of a class and feel valued by you, the more likely they are to stay engaged in the course. And then email, I mean, simple email. Uh, students can collaborate using email. That's another tool that could be used. Now, Janie is gonna share with you some tools for building collaboration in the community. So I'm gonna turn the time uh, back over to Janie. All right, so two more tools that, again, I'll give you a really quick overview of, and then we'll cover more in upcoming sessions. Uh, these tools are just like the last ones where I said you can use them independently or you can kind of um, app smash them together with your learning management system if you wanted to do it that way. These two tools are really great for promoting collaboration and communication in your digital classroom. And my favorite thing about these two tools, and part of why I picked them, is because they both have really great moderation features so that students can't just, uh, you know, kind of go crazy on their and then you wake up in the morning and there's all of these, you know, mean bullying comments or something like that. It's, it's really easy to keep track of what all of your students are doing and posting on these. So the first one is called Padlet. It is a website, it is also an app. And basically Padlet lets you make these really beautiful boards. They're almost like digital bulletin boards where you can post text and pictures and your students can as well. So all together, you can create this big, beautiful visual board with lots of information that you all contributed to. Go ahead to the next slide. So when you go to Padlet and you decide to create a new board, you have these eight different options for what you want your board to look like. Typically, I usually use wall, um, every time somebody posts a picture or text or any sort of content, it just kind of shows up randomly all over the wall, sort of like a bulletin board. But you have all of these different options to choose from. For the example that I'm about to show you, I actually chose the dark blue one called Map. And I'm sure um, for all of these, but especially for Map, you could really think of some ways to utilize that with your students. Next slide. So here is what the map board looks like. It is literally just a map of the world. And when you click on that pink plus sign in the top right corner, or when your students click on it, because it looks the same for them as it does to you for the most part, you can add a location in the world and also a comment with it. So you can see I posted, there's my name at the top, Janie Everett, and I, um, clicked on Cairo, Egypt, and then I wrote a comment saying, I would like to travel to Egypt because I want to see the pyramids. So the point of this Padlet in particular would be an icebreaker. As you can see, the title at the top is Travel Icebreaker. If you could travel anywhere in the world right now, where would you go to? And there was my comment. And then as all of the students select their location and type their comments, you'll start seeing all of those little text bubbles popping up all over the map. And it's a really great way to just make sure that you're keeping that community feeling, you know, in your classroom, even though you're not all face to face at the moment. Um, to share a Padlet, you can give, there are a lot of different options actually, but two of the most common ones I have at the bottom, you can give your students a link. So you could pop that right into an LMS or you could give them a, um, a QR code like I have down there as well. They can just scan with their devices. Go ahead to the next slide. So like I mentioned, here are some of the settings for Padlet. 
you can make sure on the first one that their name is above each post, that you don't have a bunch of anonymous posts. You can decide whether or not they can comment on each other's or like each other's posts. You can require approval. So you have to read the post before it can actually show up on the Padlet for everybody else to see. And you can also choose the filter profanity setting, but um, if you're the moderator, then I'm sure you're weeding all of that out anyway. Go ahead to the next slide. And we saved my absolute favorite for last. If you know Flipgrid, you know that they are just one of the coolest companies out there right now. Teachers love using it, students love using it. They're all over Twitter, they're all over conferences. And my favorite thing about Flipgrid is that they're always listening to teachers and doing updates that really benefit students. Um, they really wanna make the classroom a fun place to learn and they are just constantly adding really cool new features. So basically Flipgrid is you the teacher creating this grid where you give students a question or a topic, something that you want them to respond to. Um, and instead of students responding in text like we normally would in a discussion or a journal, students get to respond by creating short videos. And I know at first it can sound like a bit much because, oh, students are creating videos. It can get crazy. But again, as I mentioned, Flipgrid has really phenomenal settings to make sure that things do not get out of hand. Um, there's a moderator setting. Uh, there's a setting where you can set a time limit so that their video can't be over a certain amount of minutes. You really have a lot of power as a teacher in this situation. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is what it looks like when you're first setting it up. You give a title to your grid. I named this one Book Reports. And it also has a really great security feature so that not just any random person can get in and see videos that your students recorded because that would be a little bit scary. So <laughs> what I always did when I worked in a school district is I chose the first option that says school email. And when you choose that, you type in your domain. So mine was at VB students. And when I typed that in, now only users logging in with a VB student's email can get into that Flipgrid. So it's a really nice way to keep it safe. Go ahead to the next one. So here's where you would <coughs> type your prompt. I said, post your oral book report. There's a five minute maximum, so they can't go over five minutes. At the bottom, you can see there is a recording time. I chose five minutes. You can choose all the way up to 10 or there are some um, shorter options as well, like 30 seconds, two minutes, things like that. And there's that awesome moderation setting where if you select that, then you as the teacher have to view the videos first and approve them before they go onto the grid so that, <coughs> excuse me, so that nothing inappropriate is being posted for your whole class to see. Go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> so that's actually me. And um, I just wanted to show you this to see how fun it is. This is a screenshot I took while I was actually recording one. There's an annotation tool. There are stickers. You can put up a whiteboard or a blackboard to draw on if you don't want it to be your face. You can uh, put text up there. I put a filter on that kind of, you know, blurred out my face. Some parents may not feel comfortable, especially with younger students. Uh, putting recordings of themselves online. So there's this awesome filter for parents or students who would rather be a little bit more anonymous. Um, it's, it's super fun. The kids absolutely love it. When they see we're doing Flipgrid, they just lose their minds in a good way. <laughs> Go ahead to the next slide. And so this is sort of what it looks like once a bunch of students have posted their videos, they click on that big green plus to add a video and it's very simple and self-explanatory for them to get through. And then they all show up like this, their, their picture and their name and the kids can go ahead and click on all of the other videos and, and watch what everybody else in their classroom had to say. So yet again, just another really great way to keep your classroom feeling like a community even when you're not in the same room as each other. All right, 
go ahead next slide so um, if you are interested in learning more about these tools and actually how to use them and examples of how you might use them in your classroom or your digital classroom there are going to be two more sessions coming up on those class dojo screencastify and padlet are going to be one session on tuesday june 30th at 4 p.m that will be a zoom session as will the nearpod and flipgrid session which will be thursday july 9th at 4 p.m and we will make sure we get you information to sign up for those if you're interested Okay, thank you, Janie. Now we're gonna take just a few minutes to share with you. We've shared with you some tools and Janie's gonna be doing some more in-depth work with those tools in the, the two upcoming webinars. But we wanna share with you some resources that are available through WHRO so that you know that where to find these and you know that you can use these for teaching at a distance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to, as soon as I locate it, here we go. I'm going to take you to the WHRO website. This is WHRO.org. You'll notice up here there is a tab called Educators. When you click on Educators, it takes you to a page that will show you the resources, some of which we're going to talk about today. You'll see eMedia VA is listed. Our online courses are listed. VA TV Classroom, Professional Development Webinars, the two webinars that Jenny mentioned, plus one that comes after that uh, dealing with web conferencing software, uh, can be found on this page. If you click this link, you can register on that page. Some of you indicated that the email you received had the wrong URL. If you'll go to the WHRO website, click on Educators and come to this page, you can click on this page webinar and you can uh, register there. The links are working there. Uh, distance learning resources. And then there's a uh, section down here on Martha Reads, which is a weekly reading program we do for young children. Martha Razor, our manager of uh, early childhood, reads uh, and streams on uh, Facebook Live each week. So the first resource we're gonna talk about is eMedia VA. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay for a few minutes uh, to share with you uh, information about eMedia VA. So let me stop sharing so she can share. Hi guys. Um, hopefully you can see my screen and I see that we are almost out of time. So I'm going to just go really fast um, and tell you where you can find some more resources to learn more about eMedia VA. So, uh, I'm Lindsay, and I'm the project manager for eMedia VA, which is Virginia's premier digital content library for Virginia teachers. So chances are, as a, um, a teacher with an owner member school division, you've heard about eMedia VA, but uh, you know, we're really doing everything we can as a team to support teachers with distance learning and whatever the fall is going to be. Hopefully, you'll find eMedia VA as a really wonderful resource uh, for some of the initiatives that both Elmer and Jamie were talking about. So. Uh, really quickly, why would you use eMedia VA? How can you use it? And then how to get started. So, as I mentioned, eMedia VA is the largest digital content library that caters to Virginia educators. So, everything we have in our content library is geared towards the SOLs. So, it makes it really easy to find exactly what you're looking for. We have over 150,000 digital media resources from the most trusted names in education. So, that 150,000 a lot of videos, a great image database, uh, audio source recordings, things like oral histories, podcasts, interactives and simulations, uh, lesson plans, documents and PDFs for students to read And our content library covers all subjects and a to post-secondary. It's also flexible. So again, it's great for online learning because it's built to serve like I mentioned, all of those grades anytime, anywhere for free. So everything in our library is available 100% free of charge. Uh, and these are just some of the content providers. So as you can see, these are some of the most trusted names in education. Uh, the strong majority of our content comes from our PBS member station. So anything created for an education audience, uh, 
buy a station around the country, we make available to you for free in eMedia. So uh, how can you use eMedia VA? So you can use it for a traditional learning environment and uh, you can use it for flipped classroom, digital uh, and distance learning. We're hearing from more and more teachers that they're also uh, using eMedia VA as a student research tool. So, you know, as Jane, you know, with Nearpod and things like that, if your students are creating videos and they want uh, you know, you're talking about fair use and you want to make sure that they're using images and videos that they have the rights to use and also maybe they're interested in cutting those down and just using parts of them or manipulating or modifying. Uh, Amy DVA makes it very clear what you have permissions to do and not to do. Uh, and if you are a division that uses Google Classroom, we offer one click uh, posting to Google Classroom. So it's a really great digital content library to go along with uh, Google Classroom. So getting started, uh, you know, with logging in, I'll pull up the site just briefly to show you uh, where you would go to find your account. Uh, pretty much everyone in our member school divisions has an account, whether or not you know it. So if you are a Clever division, chances are we are connected on Clever. So, you know, just some of the divisions who are participating. So Chesapeake, uh, York County, uh, WJCC. So if you're not an OWJCC, Portsmouth, Suffolk, you guys would use your division login credentials. So your division LDAP, whatever you would use to sign into your computer or to check your mail, that's ideally what you would use with a media VA. Uh, or uh, if you're at a private school or I saw, you know, there was a, some Head Start teachers, you're probably going to be in a manual account creation. So you can just send us an email uh, and we'll take care of that for you. So Again, I'm not going to go too into detail, but here's the login page. So if you're a clever division, it's emediaVA.org slash login, and you can see it in the top right-hand corner. Uh, you can log in with clever, or you can look up your login options. So you can look by division, and it will tell you. So here's Charlottesville. Yeah, you probably already have an account, but if you have any issues, here's your rep. So every division does have an emediaVA rep that's responsible for accounts. You can check in with them. Uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and end here because I know we are out of time, but I did want to, if you have any questions, there's a contact form that comes directly to my email. And if you go to emediaVA.org slash help, we have a ton of video tutorials. So this is one I would recommend. Uh, it's a 20 minute quick start tutorial. So it shows you really briefly, you know, how to use our search feature uh, and then also how to create playlists, which is one of the coolest things about eMediaVA. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and end there. But again, if you have any questions or would like more information, we can also do trainings just for your school, just for your content team. Uh, you can use that contact form located at the bottom of eMediaVA.org. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I know we're at the end of, we've reached the end of the hour. We're going to take just a few minutes extra. I'd like for Mitzi to spend some time talking about resources, other resources that are available um, and that are also on that same page that I showed you. So uh, Mitzi, let me give you some time to talk. All right, I'll make this like super quick. Lindsay, you did a great job going fast. So let me see if I can keep up with you. <laughs> Um, so really quickly, WHRO produces a lot of, a lot of digital content. Um, so look at my screen, uh, Lindsay was in, um, eMedia VA and in there we've created right now three video courses. Um, there are for upper middle school and high school at this point. These are algebra one, there's a geometry series, there's an earth science video series course. Um, we do create some VR 360 programs. This was specifically is geared at middle school students and making decisions. Um, and then the part that we wanted to focus on here is a little bit about our online courses. Um, so you, I'm going to flip through these and get past that. So we have um, all of these full online courses that are available. These again are upper uh, middle, excuse me, and high school core courses. Um, we have um, modules that are really geared at um, workplace readiness skills for anybody who's in that CTE field. Um, we have some modules about digital citizen and um, a professional development course for online teaching um, methodology for teachers. So um, a lot of digital content that's available um, in an online format um, for schools. If you are one of our owner members, you have all of these, all of that you have available. Um, Elmer showed you the education resources page. You can click on this link. Um, 
you can click here and you can go and see more about um, our online courses and, and what they are. And again, there's a catalog here um, as well. We have given content away to the Commonwealth of Virginia for free, even those outside of our region. Um, like the environmental science course, the um, middle school career investigations course, all of that is available even if you weren't a WHRO owner member. Um, so, so that information is available online. And I think Elmer said we're only doing online courses right now, so I'll stop with that. So I went fast. Thank you, Mitzi. And if you are a secondary teacher and you're not aware of the online courses, you really should um, get more information about them. These are fully developed textbook independent courses. Everything the student has to read, view, do, all of it, assignments, quizzes, it's all there. A student doesn't need a textbook, they just need a teacher to guide them through it. And every school division in our region has access to all of those courses to use within whatever learning management system they're using. So if you're a secondary teacher, uh, it is an invaluable resource if you're going to be teaching at a distance. And you can use parts of it, you can use all of it. It's a great flexible tool. And then going back to Lindsay's uh, presentation on eMedia VA, 160,000, over 160,000 learning objects all searchable by SOL that you can use for instruction. You can direct students to go to it, to view items, just give them the URL. Um, it's a great resource and has some great content in it. So we hope that you'll check out those pages, that, that page on our website and check out the resources. Now that brings us to the end of our presentation today. We appreciate you being with us. I'll stick around to answer questions. But this really brings us to the end of our presentation. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we hope that you'll be back for next week's presentation where Janie goes in depth, actually the next two weeks where she goes in depth into some of those tools and maybe back for the last of the webinar series, which deals with web conferencing software. So thanks for joining us today. And as I said, I'll stick around for a while to try to answer questions. Now I can see that we have a lot of traffic in the chat area. If you asked a question in the chat area and it wasn't answered, please uh, ask again. I'm trying to look through here, but it would be easy for me to lose something. I see a question about where can I find the first session. We don't have the recording uh, link posted yet, but it will be on that same page where the links to register are. Uh, there will be a link to the recording and we should have that up in the next few days.
right now we don't uh, see a question about other uh, others watching and get the PD points. We don't really have any way of tracking that right now, unfortunately. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and end this session. Any final questions? Thanks again for attending today. We'll see you hopefully next week. Goodbye. <laughs>